Welcome, this is Mara and Ben for Stellar Strategy Gaming, and today we're going to be talking about all the problems with making a good BBEG. Specifically, everybody seems to either want to fight God, want to fight something that they can take down in one round, or have something with so little backstory and interest that it might as well be a paper cutout. Yes, and to expand upon that point of fighting God, I have seen it uh, the one that I always tend to see, and I have been guilty of myself in the past, are the people who want to fight Cthulhu. That that one, we're going to get into if you want to fight like a proper deity later, but if you're fighting some sort of eldritch horror whose machinations are unknown and ancient, you're not going to win against this thing, if you're even going to fight it at all. Uh, it's discussed in, at the risk of going too much into another mythology, Go, in Lovecraftian lore, it's talked about how the Cthulhu, which is seen by the sailors who first spot him, is 1% of his actual self, and it towers beyond cities. You know, like, if, if you're going to try and fight this creature, my advice is don't, really, just because you're not going to do it right. In d and the relationship between elder evils and mortal beings, the way I would describe it is, if you could imagine a colony settling somewhere and thriving for generations and your family has been living in this colony for many many generations your history goes back descending into myth in terms of how you got there and one day a sudden light shines on the colony and you look up and you see an enormous eye just staring at the colony and scanning everything and then it goes away and you think that was weird and then sometime later, your entire colony is filled with a noxious vapor and everybody tries to flee and they can't. And it's just, it's just the end of every living thing you've ever known. Now, what I've just described is a termite colony being discovered. And that is what the elder evils see humans or elves or dwarves as. When you talk about the elder evils, it's not that they're evil in the sense that of, say, sacrificing people to an evil deity. It's evil in the sense that they're so gargantuan, so ancient, so unknowable that our lives, our experiences, and everything we do are just so minuscule to them that it wouldn't even occur to them to attempt to preserve it any more than we would worry about the fate of an insect colony and to be honest at that I'm probably understating the relationship. The elder evils many of them are described as being older than the multiverse. Yes so getting into that multiverse as well uh, there is actually a specific god quote-unquote in D&D who's a much better example than Cthulhu who I just remembered his name is Hadar and he is a very, very unique being in that no other creature exists like him in the entirety of the, panth of the base pantheons. And that is because he is known as the Red Star because he is so large that he is actually planet-shaped in size and scope. And unlike every other being in the multiverse, including the Far Realms, he exists outside of it all, which is an unusual exception because in D&D it's addressed in multiple places in the lore that traditional planets and solar system systems don't exist. So the fact that he does exist in that same sort of system really shows just how different and unusual he is. And so he really is, he belongs on a pantheon just because... Again, he's a literal planet. He's, he's stronger than Ego from the Marvel series. Yes, there's another example of something like that called Atropus, the planet born dead, which is literally a planet that was the afterbirth of the creation of the gods. And it gives off beings called Atropals that when an Atropal enters or even gets near a planet, like healing magic stops working, literally changes the entire flow of magic. And this is just a just a tiny offshoot of Atropus. So if in your campaign you want to somehow be taking on an entity like that, the only way you can really do that would be, you can do a few things. One of them is it can be a situation where you've got cultists who are trying to raise the, the entity that you're describing. They're trying to maybe cause it to manifest in the world. 
in which case your BBEG wouldn't be the entity itself so much as it might be a level 20 warlock of that entity, possibly with some minions helping him out. Or it could be the kind of thing where that entity is starting to manifest in the world. It is entering the world in a physical form. You know, you've got refugees from other worlds coming through portals in desperation trying to escape. And you then have the situation where what you're trying to do is not fight the entity directly, not I'm going to roll a d20 to see if I can hit this thing with my longsword. It's I'm going to try to find a way to gather all of the elements I need to banish it back to wherever it came from. Uh, yes, and for those of you who think that there that sounds oddly familiar as far as uh, storytelling goes, that's actually because that is the exact plot, basically, of the Black Mesa video game, which is the prequel to the beloved Half-Life series, in which, spoiler alert, you fight a really big monster who's stuck between dimensions, and it takes everything you have just to fight this thing, and I think you die at the end. And then you learn that that thing was not actually very hostile towards humanity. It was fleeing something much bigger and much scarier, which I also find to be an interesting twist on the big bad trope in that the, this creature was not fleeing another bigger creature. There was not always a bigger fish, as it were. Instead, he was fleeing an organization, uh, one that was so large and so vast and powerful that it almost was a living being in its own right. It operated without really one mind. Yes. Now, if you're saying, but we really, really just want to fight Cthulhu, or we really, really want to fight Walth, the Queen of Spiders, there is another way to go about it. And it is as complicated as it is awesome. It works better with deities than it does with elder evils because of the way deities gain their powers. Now, trying to kill a deity is no joke. In the lore, there are descriptions of things like Ultraloth, things that are at the top level of the Yugoloths, the sort of neutral evil equivalent of demons, interacting with lesser deities, interacting with Verun specifically in the, the series that covered the Silence of Walf. And <clears throat> when this creature interacts with Verun, there is no question that it is following Verun's every order. To be clear, an Ultraloth is a CR-13 monster, plus they have armies of lower CR monsters at their disposals. In the Ultraloth specifically is a high-level magic user, and in this lore it was the second most powerful Ultraloth on its plane of existence. So the fact that it was that afraid of Verun gives you an indication of how tough it is to take on even a lesser deity. So, if you want to kill Loth, here's what you do. You have to start by finding ways to take away followers of Loth, because that's the way deities gain their power. And to do that, what you would need to do, this is much too big of a task for a simple adventuring party would need would be able to do, you would need to coordinate with the deities of all of the other drow pantheon to find ways to make concerted efforts to do mass conversions away from Walth's following as well as destroy her cities and temples and so forth. Then you need direct intervention of the gods in order to get you to her plane of existence and get you the kind of magical weaponry that you would need to take on even a lesser deity. And then, <laughs> once you're in the abyss, you're in the abyss. Any plan that involves you being in the abyss is a very problematic plan. You need allies within the abyss to help you do this. And if you're thinking, my goodness, by the time we get anywhere near all of this, we're, we would have to have a level 20 party. Yep, the whole party would be level 20, and you would be taking on something that would be the equivalent of a CR 40. And you would still <laughs> need every magic item in the book and a few that you'd have to make up. Now, if you could pull this off, I just YouTube it, man. I want to see that campaign. I want to see every minute of it. I will, I will watch that all day. Yes, and... Uh, a very good example of how to do this right is actually Terry Pratchett's, uh, I forget exactly which book it is, but it's, in effect, an organization has hired an assassin to kill 
the, that universe's version of Santa Claus, because when that universe's version of Santa Claus dies, the Elder Evils who hired this person can, in effect, watch the universe disintegrate around it, because that version of Santa Claus bound reality. And so what this assassin does is he doesn't go try to stab Santa Claus. It's an idea. What he, what he does is he uses a very powerful form of magic to erase him from everyone's memory. So no one believes in him anymore. And in fact, the only way that he ends up surviving in the end is not by his own volition, but a much more powerful primordial force, death, has to step in to save, his, uh, save this other being's life. The book and movie being referenced there is called Hogfather. It's part of Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. And uh, toward the end of that series, the author was in declining health, so the last few books, which were Unseen Academicals and Snuff, were not as good as the rest, but up to that point, there were something like 30 books in that series, and they were amazing. Now... There's a problem at the opposite end of the spectrum, which I've run into a lot as a DM, which is I'm going to have my party take out this band of orcs, and there's going to be a big bad orc war chief with all sorts of favor of Grumsh behind him, and somebody calls to hold person on him, and now everybody's attacking him with advantage, and now he's dead, and that was it, and that it just nothing. This wow, this really sucked. It's really anticlimactic when you find yourself in a situation where the party can take out the BBEG in like five turns and nobody in the party is ever in any real danger. There are a couple of ways you can get around this. One of them is have some minions floating around who can support the BBEG. And I don't just mean, you know, CR one quarter goblins or whatever. I mean, make the minions actually formidable. Make them things that can sort of tie up some of the party's attention and resources, things the party can't ignore while they just go after the BBEG. In addition, throw in some legendary resistances, maybe some magic items, and definitely some healing. Also, not to put too fine a point on it, you're the DM. The party doesn't know what's going on behind the screen. Oh, this is just a stupid work we're going to take. My God, he just knows fireball. What are we going to do? Oh, yes, and also a great way to, using that example, make the orc captain a little more terrifying is have three priests or something. Follow him around, giving him a plus four to armor class each, you know? Make it very clear early on that you're not going to touch his armor class until you kill these three other creatures. That way he has a chance to do some damage to the party. The party will waste a little bit of spell slots on him. Then they have to go kill the priest without getting hit by him. Then finally it's an even fight, and it also means that they will no longer be able to cheese the action economy as much because they'll be lower health and have less spells, and on top of that, they'll get a little more experience because they killed a few more creatures. Yes, absolutely. One sort of an odd variation I did on this, now this may not be my most popular recommendation, I'm just throwing it out there as something you can do. I ran a custom campaign, a homebrew campaign, where Sigil, the city of doors, the city that uh, has planar portals to pretty much every realm of existence was being taken over by were rats and the plan of the were rats was they were going to take over and then they would be able to spread their evil across the multiverse so mara had played in this campaign the first time i ran it i was running it a second time with a different group now Mara already knew the campaign, already knew all the twists and surprises and all of that. So rather than having Mara just sort of look surprised, we did something a little bit different. We had Mara secretly be a were-rat in the service of the big bad. And I gotta say, the look on everybody's face when they figured it out in that climactic scene at the end was pretty priceless. Yes, and it would have been significantly better had my character not had like 12 health in total and then immediately ragdolled as soon as I got hit by a level 1 firebolt. Uh, but yes, it was for, for that moment, it was amazing, and it, that failure of character was not on the DM, but was on me for not designing them correctly. So when you're, when you're building your BBEG, <clears throat> it has to be something where there is enough parity between the power of the BBEG and the power of the party to make that final battle interesting. 
In addition, something many DMs, including some great DMs, I have to say, really struggle with is building up that BBEG to where the party cares. You have to want that BBEG to either be redeemed or be defeated. You have to feel something toward them. It's hard to really come up in, with examples in film or movies or books where that has really happened. Very often what you find is that you get to a certain point and the BBEG is just this kind of wet sandwich of a villain compared to everything we've seen the hero go through. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, I have a few examples of this. One in a campaign that uh, was run by a person we've referenced as Charlie. At the very end of said campaign, there was an elder brain thing, maybe, or like half dragon, half, half elder brain, which absolutely no one cared about because there were no hints of its existence up until the last session. And it was just sort of, what 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 do we do here? Because we don't know if it's a good guy, we don't know if it's a bad guy. It was just sort of there. Um, but an example of a villain having a good, if not better, story arc than the heroes in anything, and this might surprise some of you, but to others will come as no surprise, is Ice King from Adventure Time. Uh, he starts out as the wet sandwich villain. He exists to fill... Uh, the time between the big bad boss fights with the Lich King. Um, but then they introduced Marceline and started expanding upon the Ice King story, and you see that he is, first off, more powerful than almost any other being on the Land of Ooh, to the point where I believe he was essential in defeating the Lich King in the end. But you also see the hardship that he go has to go through, and the sorrow, and... Uh, it really is a good comparison to Alzheimer's as well, um, because he forgets himself, and he knows he's forgetting himself as, as this happens. Uh, and in a way, by the end of the show, you actually care more about Ice King than you do about Finn and Jake, because in some ways, he has gone through things which are heart-wrenching, which they will never go through. Yes, well, and that's actually something that anybody who has watched pro wrestling... Yes, I will admit to this, I have no shame. I used to watch pro wrestling. Anyone who watches pro wrestling can tell you, it's not that hard to make a compelling good guy. To make a compelling villain is really difficult. And what makes the most compelling villains are people who, at some level, you sympathize with them. At some level, you want them to win. At some level, you understand what this person went through and and you just really, really feel for them. Darth Vader is an excellent example of that. I kind of feel like having Emperor Palpatine turn out to be the big bad in the original Star Wars trilogy was a mistake because Vader was such a more compelling character. And that's actually a really... I think I'm going to go ahead and end with this because it may be the best point I make this entire video, is that it doesn't always have to end with you killing the BBEG. Now, he doesn't have to turn out to be a good guy and, and go play with kittens and plant flowers, but it can end with some sort of redemption. It can end with some sort of redemptive sacrifice. That actually could be a really interesting way for your party's tangle with Hadar or Cthulhu or, or even Walth to go is for this entity to say, you know, I have existed for so long Everything I do, I wind up eradicating entire interesting and innocent civilizations. I just want it to end. As always, we thank you very much for watching. Please give us your thoughts. What makes a great BBEG? What do you want to avoid when you're creating a BBEG? And what other topics would you like to see us do for videos? Uh, yes, and... The last thing I would have to say is also just uh, be careful about tone. That is my final thought, is uh, if you're running a campaign that is super serious and set in the world of Innistrad or Strahd's world or whatever it is, don't have the Ice King be the main villain. You know, he's too comedic. And the same goes the other way around. If you're in the land of Ooh and Strahd suddenly shows up, you're not going to like the campaign nearly as much unless that was already a possibility from the beginning. But with that... 
we're gonna say uh, thank you for watching again, and we have been loving all the support. Next time you will get to see uh, setting up your campaign setting. Uh, it'll, it should be quite an interesting time, and we hope you enjoyed.